Somebody asked me today if it's Shakespeare lives or Shakespeare lives. So we may kind of investigate that today. Uh, I'm privileged to be here. Volder should be privileged and is privileged to have this festival and to have these wonderful panelists over here. Thank you for being here. Um, the diversity in town just went up significantly. <laughs> the intelligence as well and the conversation. So thank you. Please come back. Um, I'm going to kind of skip some introductions. Uh, I'll, I'll say this very quickly. Get their books. Uh, see her movie. Uh, we That Are Young, uh, a must read. Uh, the Fisherman must read. And you have a, the, your new book is not here yet, right? In January. In January. So wait for it, OK? An Orchestra of Minorities. Yes, don't miss it. And there was a great conversation with you yesterday at the Canyon Theater. Um, so. We're dealing with Shakespeare. We're uh, trying to understand how uh, this man who lived so 400 years ago influenced our cultures since so much. And so I'll just start off by, random, by asking you guys to, in random order, just uh, get in there, um, to describe how he influenced you as writers and who he is to you as a writer. OK. Well, uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. It's a pleasure and an honor to be sitting with uh, uh, Sabrina and Pretty. And uh, of course, you, uh, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, my <laughs> relationship, so to say, with Shakespeare uh, goes back uh, to when I was really uh, you know, a, a little boy. Uh, I, I don't know why uh, I've asked my dad, but he doesn't really have a genuine uh, you know, reason for why almost all the books he had when I was, you know, a, a boy w were Shakespeare books, you know, Hamlet, Macbeth, and the rest of them, and a few Nigerian novels by Amos Tutuola, Chino Achebe, and all that. Uh, so I grew up reading the things on his shelf. So, you know, uh, without knowing who Shakespeare was, I just read most of his works as a little boy. So, uh, so, and I would say uh, that, you know, uh, unconsciously, some of the narrative structures and elements probably, you know, just, I, I devoured them without knowing. And, you know, years later when I wrote The Fisherman, and uh, suddenly everyone is saying it's a tragedy. And I'm like, okay, well, <laughs> maybe, you know, I owe this to uh, Mr. Shakespeare. <laughs> Can I ask, did you, read in, did you read him in English from your father's shelf? Or? Yes, in English, yes. How did you, did you understand all of it? Or was it That was a question that was asked me yesterday. I, I'm not sure I did understand, but I just was reading them, you know, uh, for the... I think that I, I probably did, because I, I could remember uh, years later uh, when I picked up some of these books again. You know, uh, like I, I remember reading uh, Hamlet again, uh, this time in college. And I was like, yeah, you know, I remember the story. And Macbeth, of course, you know, there were witches there. Some of his works, you know, had elements that stayed with you, you know, even as a child. So, but, but I had a hard time with some of the vocabulary at the time. So, but, you know, we had this big dictionary which I would always, <laughs> you know, consult as I read him, yes. I asked because I was in my early 30s when a friend of mine basically needed a, a loan and I was happy to give it to him. And he said, but I won't be able to give it back. And I said, you know what, let's do a barter because he's, he's, his English is wonderful, his Shakespeare is wonderful. You'll, well, let's read Shakespeare in English together because I, I always found that I'm missing out. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's amazing that you... Um, that you could pick it up as a child. So thank you for sharing that. Sabrina? Um, I guess my relationship also, to some extent, um, stems to childhood. I grew up in India, and our, um, I went to an English medium school. So um, since it was very influenced by the British Raj, most of our private schools, especially when I was growing up and even now, um, are incredibly influenced by the empire um, and by Britain. So Shakespeare was, of course, held to a very high standard because you, know, you really weren't anyone in the world unless you spoke English and knew Shakespeare. Um, and so Shakespeare was considered high art, um, you know, something that uh, smart people knew. 
And uh, that's how I viewed it. So, you know, to some extent I resisted it because, you know, anything that's something that's something that smart people should do sounds incredibly boring. Mm -hmm. um, so I, um, you know, we, we, we were made to read it in school and so, you know, and we did and, you know, suffered through a lot of the words and language. And then as I got older and I sort of stumbled my way into screenwriting, um, I kind of rediscovered Shakespeare again and also found that Shakespeare wasn't writing high art in his time at all. He was playing to the gallery. It was incredibly commercial work. It's the worst basis instincts of Hollywood is what he was pandering to. And then I was like, okay, this I can get into. So... <laughs> Um, and so I rediscovered it again um, and um, found that it was so much fun. I still honestly have problems with some of the language, some of the words, but you know, it just does get easier. Um, and I can come back to this later and I found that it's of course been very influential because you know, and again, working as a screenwriter in America, and I live in New York, so New York tends to be much more independent film, you know, um, based, which also means they think of themselves as superior to, like, broad commercial films that come out of Los Angeles. Um, <clears throat> and, um, um, and so I found when I came to America that I would try to blend my writing towards what I thought was a more sophisticated... Uh, you, as you can tell, the theme of my life has been... Um, wanting to belong to a world that I didn't grow up in at all. Um, <clears throat> and, um, but then when you read Shakespeare, it's like Shakespeare was doing all the things that I was used to doing and wanted to do in film because I grew up influenced by Bollywood. And Shakespeare really is essentially Bollywood cinema. It's melodramatic, it goes out there, it doesn't care about being on the nose, it's super lyrical, people want to die in love. You know, everything was hitting sort of the peaks that I always tended to hit but wanted to scale back because then it wouldn't be subtle and refined enough. Um, so, as a writer, that's been my influence. Also, as a teacher, Shakespeare's been very influential, but I can come back to that. I suppose I come to Shakespeare from the other side of the empire, in a way, because I was born in the UK. My parents um, moved there in 1968, and I came along, you know, years later. And uh, we, we, we had Lamb's Tales from Shakespeare, the children's version, which most young people in the UK get given. It's probably very similar here, maybe. And, and then we do it at school, you have to. It's part of the curriculum. It's all around us in the air. And again, with a sense that Shakespeare is very high culture, but if you have a really good English teacher, that can just change your life. And for me, that is what happened. I had this amazing English teacher, Mary Campbell, who is retired now, but I still know her. And she taught me King Lear. And I just remember being one of these young people who had a strong sense of social injustice, possibly because I was mediating being British and Asian at the same time, all the time. And I remember lines that just hit me back then, which still stay with me when I look at our politicians and I look at some of the things that are going on in the world today, where even though there is this king and he is very powerful and he is ordering everybody around him in his court to obey him and to flatter him, there are a couple of people who stand up to that and one of them is his very loyal follower, Kent. And he says, to plainness, honor's bound. And I just remember being so blown away by that line when I was young because it was like a kind of life lesson that one should always speak what we feel, not what we ought to say, which is sort of the end of, of that play, King Lear. And then, you know, this young character, Cordelia, who very much is, an, she's very annoying because she's so kind of self-righteous in a way, but she tries to be true and she stands up to her father. And as an Indian daughter growing up in the UK, always being told, you know, remember whose daughter you are and you have to behave in a certain way to be able to pass in different worlds. The idea that you could sort of stand up for, to that and say to your father, actually, I'm just going to be true to who I think I ought to be, um, uh, it was really striking to me. Um, I always wanted to be a fiction writer. Life takes you in lots of different directions, um, so it took 20 years before I came back to the play when I was finally ready to write a novel or to have a go at it. And, um, and the play was just inside me, ready to be transposed to contemporary India, which is sort of like bringing together my parents' home and the home that I grew up in. Can you say more maybe about how King Lear has influenced, uh, you adapted or you made a modern adaptation of King Lear? So my book, We That Are Young, is a t retelling or a translation, I call it, of Shakespeare's King Lear. And um, 
It's, it's told in five voices from the perspective of the five young people in the play. There are three daughters and there are two sons. And instead of being um, a king, this is a man who is the head of an incredibly powerful company. And I use the word company very advisedly because, of course, the empire started in India with the East India Company. And now um, that sense of colonization has been taken over by big business. And so that is colonizing every aspect of our lives. It becomes something that um, shapes what we buy, how we, what we're, what's advertised to us, what we can aspire to being. It works on us in ways that we have no idea about. It kind of colonizes our minds in a way. So I was using that um, kind of pun in, and to try to explain something about capitalism. And I set the book in India because, partly because of this thing I'm talking about to do with roots, but also because the play begins with the division of a kingdom. And it's ex an extraordinary thing because when I was at school, no one ever talked about the Indian partition. But I was getting all of these stories at home from my aunts and my mother. And you know, my, gr my grandmother never wanted to come to the UK because she sort of blamed the English for all of the things that had happened to her family. She had moved from what is now inside Pakistan to England um, in 1940, to, um, to Delhi in 1947. So she was part of this huge migration of people and she had left everything behind in Lahore. And then suddenly when I was at school, I suddenly saw this division of the kingdom being discussed in the classroom via Shakespeare, the pinnacle of culture. And, uh, and then so the, the book sort of has this partition history. Um, King Lear ends with um, a civil war which has fought over a piece of land. And in my novel, that place is Kashmir where the divisions that happened at the time of partition is still being reckoned with. The final piece of the puzzle of this book is to do with gender, because you know these daughters, when they first um, have to win their share of the kingdom in the play, are asked to do so as a way of gaining dowry. And now this issue of dowry linked to land, so if they, if they, they the land is their dowry, they're, they're kind of getting two of them are already married, and one of them is about to be married. And to gain their share of their dowry, they have to say how much they love their father. So there's a sense of honor, female honor and the body linked to land. And for me, this is just something so powerful because it really puts pressure on women to behave in a certain way. Um, there's so much misogyny in King Lear. It's absolutely outrageous. It's completely eye-watering. Some of the worst curses Shakespeare managed to write um, are inside that play, and, and that really spoke to me about the way that women are sometimes seen in contemporary India, as well as uh, going all the way back to Indian scriptures, um, which I also draw on quite a lot in the book. Thank you, Sabrina. Uh, you deal with film, and you did mention that Shakespeare is Bollywood for you. Um, in your uh, movie, uh, Monsoon Wedding, if anybody has not seen, uh, you're in for a treat. Um, I couldn't resist uh, it just came up this line from Angelo in uh, Measure from, we from Measure, my false will outweigh your truth, with a sexual harassment theme that is mm. happening there, coming from the wealthy possessor of the family of mm. sorts. Can you speak, first of all, has that even struck you? Has that even gone through your head as you were writing this? Were you seeing links or, or sources in Shakespeare? I actually was not, not with Monsoon Wedding. I have written um, and worked on something else, which was actually an adaptation of Hamlet set in Kashmir. Um, but um, no, I actually was reading a lot of Chekhov when I was doing Monsoon Wedding because the, uh, sorry, <laughs> because the, you know, being a society that was on this brink of going from a very traditional world to a uh, more modern, culture, you know, especially because we'd opened up our economy and with globalization, we were going through that change. It felt much more connected. Um, but uh, sure, why not? I mean, we, we can see Shakespeare in everything. Yes. Uh, Chigozi, can you speak more, or can you speak to how Shakespeare, in, in Nigeria, is there a lot of Shakespeare presence? Is there a lot of, does he, is he taught in schools? Is he, uh, are there many productions? I come from Israel. I can say that, um, He's a very popular playwright in Israel, largely because, as you know, same with the uh, film industry, there are no royalties involved. You don't have to pay the, the, the playwright. He's not going to argue if you make cuts or changes. 
and he's very adaptable. Uh, uh, Romeo and Juliet with a uh, uh, Palestinian playing uh, Juliet and a, Romeo, uh, a Jewish Ro Romeo was a, a great hit and so on. Can you speak to that? Yeah, uh, I think, yeah, of course, uh, Shakespeare is taught in schools. Uh, I, 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 I'm not very sure if I ever read him uh, as, uh, you know, as a student, but, you know, what Preti said is really true and Sabrina too. So Nigeria was colonized by Britain, so the... Uh, you know, uh, the curriculum there, I, I think, uh, at least when I was uh, growing up, uh, was patterned uh, after the British one. In fact, the, you know, our school system, I still mix things up, even though I've been living in the U.S. for about five years now. I say secondary school when I, I mean high school, you know, or something like that. So, so uh, there must have been, so I read uh, most of his works on my own and uh, so I, I'm not sure if I read him, but I know that uh, he's played a lot, uh, especially in the big cities in Lagos. You know, uh, I think uh, I have I, I didn't see it myself, but I've you know heard about productions of Shakespearean plays. Uh, but I think that uh, of the population who are into reading, most people that I educated will have read Shakespeare or come in contact with his work in one way or the other. I think, uh, for me, the thing about Shakespeare is that his works, uh, uh, they have this, so archetypes, we're talking about how archetypes are like, you know, I teach creative writing and I tell my students, uh, some of the strongest stories you can write in fiction come from like very simple archetypes. You know, I would use uh, the example of uh, one of the films that, you know, movies that touched me uh, recently. Uh, and that would be uh, Three Billboards in, uh, in uh, is it Missouri or something like that. So, so it's a very simple uh, story. A mother just wants to, you know, find the killer of her. She wants justice for her, you know, daughter. And as simple as that, it's not a complicated uh, really, if you, if you strip everything down, her desire, so to say, is that simple. But it carries the movie through. The, the strength of that movie is that you have, from the beginning of the film, we're told what she wants in very like plain terms. And the story never deviates from it till the end. So uh, I think that's what I see in Shakespeare. He takes these very archetypal uh, elements, like uh, King Lear, for instance, uh, you know, strikes me as, uh, you know, resembling even, uh, uh, you know, the Homeric, uh, you know, the poem, uh, Iliad. So it's really about vengeance. So I think uh, there's, a, there's a guy there, uh, he must be Kent or something, Edmund. Uh, Edmund is one of his sons. Uh, yes, and then he, he lies that the Edgar, I think, you know, the, the, guy, the, the, the son who is not the real one, uh, you know, wants to kill him. And so there's all these like cyclic things. It's the same thing with uh, Iliad where you have, uh, you know, uh, what's his name now? Hector. Uh, Hercules kills Hector, right? And then uh, Hector's brother. So, so these are the elements that you find in almost every mythical stories. Uh, even the ones that, uh, you know, my granny told me as a little boy. So, so he takes those things, as you said, you know, at the time they, they felt like, you know, very high culture. He, w he was like just uh, coming up with this place to, you know, the audience. He was just making them for uh, the, the present audience that, that came and paid money. Uh, he wasn't thinking maybe of like a sophisticated literary I mean, arguments can be made that he probably was doing that, but, but sometimes it comes off as if he was just writing on demand for what was uh, there. So, so, you know, this is, uh, so that's that universal element. I think we see, uh, at least I saw, I saw them when I started reading Achebe, Amos Tutuola, and these early Nigerian novels. I saw in Okonkwo, for instance, uh, you know, a tragic hero. And I, I remember thinking, well, 
this guy is like, you know, one of the Shakespearean characters. So that's what Shakespeare, you know, I think Shakespeare is, is Nigerian, so to say. He's everywhere. Yes. Um, he's also, first of all, the, the man wrote, um, what, what was it, 16th? Thousand seven hundred and something yes. used words, and of, of them, 1,500 he created or was the first to use in print. Um, 37 plays, 154, I believe, sonnets. How come he gets, what, what, what is it about him that makes him so um, accessible throughout, through cultures? Um, recently, uh, you know, we were talking about um, the, the year of Lear, um, a, a recent book called Tyrant uh, by Stephen uh, Greenblatt uh, speaks of the tyrants in, in Shakespeare and politics about our current situation, tyrant, may anybody, without mentioning the, the, not pink elephant, but maybe orange elephant in the room once by name, <laughs> not once, with tons of references. How he, how, how, what do you think it is that makes him so adaptable and accessible. And if you have, um, my, one of my favorite adaptations is actually The Tempest, Paul Mazursky film, uh, with Gina Rollins and uh, Casavetas, um, and, and, and Susan Sarandon and Raul Julia, a wonderful cast. Uh, modern day, this is modern, when I say modern, it's late 70s or maybe early 80s. Um, how is he so adaptable or what makes him so accessible? Certainly in your cultures or, or, or where you've seen him around the world? Well, um, for me, the first thing is the poetry. It is um, incredibly easy. In, you know, we talk about how difficult it was when we were young people to understand the words and so on, but it is written in 16th, 17th century language. So of course, it's going to be difficult. You need someone to help you to understand the nuances. Everybody has to go through that. It's part of school. <laughs> but there's something in the poetry which is a sort of um, call for, for hopefulness, even in the worst and the most tragic and the most evil exploration, there is a sense that um, these are characters who are struggling to somehow do better despite the structures of power that they're in. And um, the film that you worked on, Heather, which was Hamlet set in Kashmir, has this excellent joke about revolutionary poets. And I really think about Shakespeare as this kind of revolutionary poet, in a way, where the language itself is the thing that is always renewable. Because words that are so easy to understand, like, and their puns, like tender, or bond, or, um, you know, these are the kinds of words which have several different meanings and for, for people to then translate them into their own languages, they can find correlations in their own times and in their own ways. So that's the first thing. And we've all talked about colonialization and, 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 and so on. So there's two things. There's the poetry, which is wonderful. And then there's the dissemination, which is political. And for those reasons, it's spread across the world. Um, I've worked with theater makers and writers and filmmakers in different parts of the world who are making Shakespeare's plays to mediate their own conflicts. And one of the places I've worked was Zatari refugee camp, which is near the Syrian border in Jordan, where a group of young people did a version of King Lear in Arabic. And they didn't do it because somebody went into that camp who was from the RSC, the Royal Shakespeare Company or somewhere like that, um, and wanted to do Shakespeare with them, what they did was they were organized by a soap actor called Nawar Bulbul who went into the camp to distribute milk. All the children recognized him because he's a very, very famous, popular actor in Syria. And, and then he decided that he was going to put on this version of Lear because he had studied Shakespeare at drama school in Syria. And all the children had kind of knew about this play, they knew about Shakespeare and so on and so on. They had left everything behind and they had found themselves in Zatari. It's home to about 80,000 people. It's very, very dusty and so on and so on. It's run by the UNHCR. Um, and over three months, they put together this extraordinary production with 160 of the children where they did a version of Lear in Arabic. And they were able to strip down the play to take out some of the subplots, they changed the ending, but it was still recognizably King Lear. And so there's a lot of thinking around that that says, you know, how did they do that? And is it still Shakespeare? And there are some people who get very concerned about it, that how can it still be Shakespeare? And it's not our Shakespeare because it's no longer in English. 
the plot's been changed, the ending's been changed. It's, it's you know, being performed in a refugee camp in a very live situation. But there's something about the idea of the division of the kingdom, again, with these archetypes that you're talking about, that is just so translatable, unfortunately, to the contemporary moment. And when you see these kids do versions of Shakespeare, it just blows your mind that this playwright has traveled 450 years to say something through them about our contemporary moment. I'll add to that and say that uh, I, I think one of the spread of one of the reasons why Shakespeare is still so present, uh, even you know these uh, many centuries later, is also because of empire. So uh, the British covered vast space, uh, you know, uh, while they were like spreading out, you know, uh, to the the imperial uh, posture uh, and you know empire. So. And, and then, as we said earlier, most of these nations received the uh, you know educational uh, systems from from the British. So uh, Nigeria, for instance, is like uh, a kind of African, a kind of British African country, so to say. Uh, you know, you can make the the argument uh, that we are changing that now. But for a long time, in fact, the Union Jack was a flag. So. So spreading the culture, the religion, was something that the British did. So, and Shakespeare being uh, himself a, you know, a, a large figure in, in British culture. So that was one of the reasons why it spread too. Uh, another thing is because of the mystery behind the man himself. So anything that uh, you know, is mysterious in that sense. So we're talking uh, earlier about uh, the book Will in the World by, uh, uh, by Greenblatt. And uh, I mean, I love the book, but it's full of suppositions. You know, suppose, maybe we can infer that this was that, you know, that was this. Uh, so there really wasn't very much about him, you know, in, in terms of his, his personal life. So people, and he, you know, was this large, uh, homongous figure in the culture. So people were like falling over themselves for centuries to try to discover who this man was. So the more the mystery behind him increased, the more the legend around him. I think that's also one of the, the reasons why uh, you know, he, he, he looms so large in, in, in literature. Sure, although that's a little arguable. There is quite a lot of information that we do have about Shakespeare. We know, we know about you know, where he grew up. We know about what he studied in school. We know when he moved to London. We know that there was a seven year gap where, that, that before he reached London after leaving home. We know that there was a troupe, a theater troupe that was passing through uh, Stratford right before. And there's, a, there's an assumption, as you write, an assumption that he traveled with them because they made it for seven years afterwards into London and you see the plays that they did and you can see the links to the plays that he wrote later on. We know about the money. We know a lot about, about his finances. We know about his yeah. marriage. We know about his kids, about his, the death of his son. We know a lot about the man. Um, but it's true that there is a lot of mystery. I think probably also because of the, 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 the scope of his work, it almost seems inconceivable that one person maybe could, could do this kind of a thing. And therefore, um, there are various the, uh, um, you know, theories around it. One of them is that we have nothing in his handwriting except for eight signatures. That's correct, except for one page that we will be <laughs> privileged to read, to, to hear later on. Uh, read from a play that he contributed just one speech to called Thomas More. Um, and, uh, and, and Fred is, is uh, kindly uh, willing to read uh, this piece, but we'll save that for later. Um, but one of the things that strikes me is how can a same, the same play, the Coriolanus, was for the Nazis was something that, the, a play that everybody must see because it, it glorifies the Fuhrer and at the same time, same, same country. For Brecht, it was an intro to communism. So how, how, how did he manage, do you think, as a writer, to be so, um, so adaptable and so, so ready to be taken 
Um, Merchant of Venice can be done and has been done as an anti-Semitic play, and of course is a play that, that goes against anti-Semitism. Any thoughts on that? Um, you know, I, for me, I think one of the reasons why um, it works so well, um, you know, with especially when you're working um, in film because it just costs so much money to make, there's always pressure to make it as accessible as possible to as large number of people as possible. Um, which means that in a certain kind of way, it needs to be uh, as universal as it can be. And there's something about like the characters and themes of Shakespeare that are incredibly universal, that have managed to survive across time and culture. So, you know, he, um, Kurosawa is influenced by him. Um, so are Indian directors. And he himself was taking, of course, from existing mythologies and stories and Italian short stories and Danish stories. So, um, and I, I, I think maybe one of the reasons why it stays so universal, in which case it becomes incredibly adaptable, is that he creates incredibly rich characters. Um, and that's always the tricky thing. And I think once you manage to do that, um, if your characters are fleshed out and feel human enough, all of them, even the terrible ones, they all have humanity, which is a wonderful thing. Um, and I think it's that humanity that manages to speak to everyone because even though the specifics of our circumstances and our culture um, and you know, our ideology and everything else can change over time, um, as human beings, we respond to the same things. We understand loss and love and love for a child and betrayal. Those things stay the same. And I think because he touches on things that are such incredibly, profoundly, deeply human experiences, it manages to survive. Plus, as you said, you don't have to pay any royalties. But you know what? Neither did he. He stole from everyone. <laughs> he did. He did. He only wrote four original plots for all of his plays. This is yeah, true. no, that's true. And when you read, um, I've just been reading James Shapiro's 1606, The Year of Leah, which is a fantastic book because it really does show how the real, how the real world influences creativity. He really unpicks some of the reasons and the rationales behind um, the mysteries in, in King Lear. Um, I didn't know, for example, that one of the reasons why a lot of the plays are not set in a Judeo-Christian time is because back in the day when Shakespeare was writing, it was blasphemous to talk about the Christian God on stage, anywhere except in the church. So he had to set those plays somewhere in a mythical realm outside of that time and reference Merlin and pagan gods and goddesses and make all of these different appeals to different kinds of deities and draw on different kinds of mythologies and so on. And that is a very practical reason that re reminds us that creativity has to find a way to respond to its moment and the generative constraints of that moment. And it's a fascinating book. It's, it's also true uh, that uh, I think for me, I, I think that Shakespeare is also great because he, as you said, kind of wrote outside of his experiences, at least uh, the, the march that we know uh, about him. So, you know, one of the common cliche advice you get is write what you know. Uh, but Shakespeare, according to at least Greenblatt, Shakespeare seemed to have written you know, a lot of things that were outside of his experiences. And, uh, you know, the, the, take the story of Macbeth, for instance. Uh, you know, or even some of the, 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 the plays he set in the uh, uh, authorian periods and, and, and all of those old, I mean, he must have researched them, of course, uh, as, you know, some of us will write historical fiction. But there were a lot of elements that he, that he drew in this vast uh, world of myth, of, of, of so many things that, you know, this man who grew up in this small, it's a small town or village, you know, uh, people wonder how did he come up with all of these? And, uh, you know, you look at the school where they say he went to, uh, or it's confirmed that he went to, <laughs> And, you know, they, they, they didn't seem to be, you know, that much there that could have given him these ex kind of exposure. So, uh, you know, I, 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 for, for me, when I write and I think of 
Shakespeare as being an influence, I, you know, he, he drives me to want to go beyond, you know, these, of course, fiction is usually, uh, you know, so you have lived experience and then fragments here and there of lived experience and you mold them into something that becomes unrecognizable by those who have lived it. But, you know, I want to go even further than that into spheres, uh, into terrains, into domains that are really beyond, uh, you know, what I can have uh, physical access or even intellectual access into. And so, and if, you, if, you're, if your orientation is, is directed towards that, then you begin to find yourself writing things that might sometimes look almost fantastical, you know, or mythic, you know, as uh, some critics have said of The Fisherman and the new book. Yes. Um, maybe a word about gender. Uh, I know that your work, actually all of your work, um, and it's interesting that the same King Lear, uh, you have the brother themes happening in your, in your novel, and, and the sisters, and certainly the cousins maybe, and sisters in your, uh, your, um, in your film. Um, he, there were only male actors at the time. He had to write for young male actors to, to play female roles. You could, if you look at the chronology of the plays, you can assume when there was a young, talented actor, because all of a sudden there would be great female roles, and then there was a time of no female roles, and you would assume maybe there wasn't a very talented uh, actor. Um, any, any thoughts about how unique that is in, in, in the writing and how, um, how accessible as adapters. Uh, there's a, Felida Lloyd did a whole, uh, f uh, just women, uh, full cast of women doing, um, what was it? The Tempest, Henry IV, and Julius Caesar just recently worldwide and twisted the entire interpretation of these very masculine plays by just, I, I got to see Julius Caesar, it was set in a prison, in a, in a woman's high security prison. An amazing experience, and the audience had to go in through, like, you know, security checks and so on, just to go inside. Um, again, I go back to the issue of adaptability, but, all, but, but with, um, with, a, with a focus on the, on the gender roles in, in his writing. Mm -hmm. um, sure. Um. Hmm? Oh, we do. In fact, it's true. Not only does Bollywood love uh, gender switching, in the early days of Indian cinema, um, women, uh, women, were, women didn't act on film because uh, good Hindu girls and good Muslim girls wouldn't perform. Um, so whether it was theater or film, it was always men who dressed up as women um, and performed, which were at the time mostly myths and legends. And, uh, and, then, um, and then in time, actually, uh, Christian women and Jewish women started uh, performing in film because they weren't held, you know, they weren't bound by the same social constraints as Hindu and Muslim women. Um, one of the biggest events in Indian cinema was when a Brahmin girl decided to become a movie star, Devika Rani. Um, so, um, <laughs> Uh, I, one of the, uh, for me, one of the greatest uh, things that I've ever read about Shakespeare, and it's completely fictionalized, except that it's, uh, it's completely truthful in the things that matter is Shakespeare in Love, which you should all read the script. The script is absolutely brilliant. Um, and it touches upon everything, you know, it touches upon... Um, the ideas of gender, because you know Gwyneth Paltrow is cross-dressing, you know, as as a man, and they fall in love. But also with the idea of, uh, you know, when you don't have easy, you know, access in the same sort of social way to women, how do you imagine women? What that means? Um, also, just the process of rewrite. You know, and talking about how Shakespeare wasn't considered Shakespeare in his time. Um, there's a there's a wonderful line, like in the very first scene, which is fantastic and it's a great first scene in a movie ever um, where he's writing a play and uh, the producer says yeah he's he's working on it right now it's great it's called Romeo and Ethel the pirate's daughter you know <laughs> and the guy says I, I, I 
don't like it. And he goes, it's a new play by William Shakespeare. And he's like, oh, you know, cut off his nose because it goes to show that Shakespeare, you know, wasn't as exalted as he is now. Um, I mean, the only reference I can make, again, with how Bollywood Shakespeare seems to me, they say that if Shakespeare was alive right now, he'd be a screenwriter because his work is so dramatic and it's very much about scenes and plotting and character development and has openings, middles and ends in the way dramatic works have, you know, in a way a novel can afford to deviate and like be more inventive with, but dramatic writing, screen, stage or TV tends to be much more constrained. Um, is, uh, is both that Shakespeare loves beautiful dialogue, Bollywood loves dialogue. In fact, in the Bombay film industry, the, uh, it doesn't happen so much anymore, although it still happens, but historically, uh, you had one person who wrote what was called the screenplay, which was the action, the non-dialogue part, and you had a whole other person, usually an established poet, who wrote the dialogue because dialogue was so critical and so important that you actually had a poet. And again, write lines that were memorable that people would recite and would tell their lovers or quote to their children and you know, remain in popular culture forever and ever. Uh, so I don't know what to say about the women thing, but there's Bollywood and Shakespeare for you. <laughs> yeah, there's, uh, yeah, I love, uh, I've watched a lot of Bollywood Shakespeare. It's part of my work which is a tough job, but, you know, someone has to do it. And, uh, um, you know, when I look at how transgressive Shakespeare is with gender in the 16th and 17th century, you know, you're looking at this men dressing up as women, and if you then take it to the stage level, you've got men dressing up as women, dressing up as men, pretending to be little boys or little girls. You know, you've got men that turn into donkeys and, and, and fairy queens that fall in love with them. Clearly, Shakespeare never... That comes straight out of imag imagination and myths and fairy tales. He, he never kind of went into the Midsummer Night's Dream for us. So. There's a, so, so what is this imagination? It's an imagination that can always test the boundaries of social structures, the structures that are placed on the body for a start. It's very much to do with beginning with the body and then going outwards to say, okay, now I'm going to push against the family and now I'm going to push against the social world and now I'm going to think about that world on a global scale and set this play in a very far off island in the middle of nowhere where the, temp where the boat that is the Tempest can find a Caliban that is a kind of monster that is born of a rape that wants to then perpetrate that on another person. And then suddenly there's a kind of question of how language morphs into something that isn't supposed to be that language. And, and how all of that is somehow connected to whether or not there is such a thing as male or female or monster. And if there is a monster, is that monster gendered? And it's an extraordinary imagination. And over the centuries, that imagination then becomes mediated again through politics and it becomes mediated again through sort of conservative society or liberal society or whatever that is in power that's deciding how cu culture gets curated. And I'm very, very anti this idea that culture should be curated by any particular kind of um, social body. And every time you see someone do Shakespeare these days in a society where culture is deeply curated and shut down on these issues, because it's Shakespeare, they get away with it. And that is the most exciting thing. So you can have people making very, very subversive comments about their own times because they're hiding it through the Shakespeare. And Shakespeare did the exact same thing in his own time. So, you know, that is exciting. Thank you. Uh, we have to um, open it up to questions. Yes, thank you. Uh, before we do, just as a final touch of Shakespeare, um, because of relevance as we spoke, um, Freti is kind to be, to be willing to read to us uh, this one piece that Shakespeare wrote in a play called Thomas More that addresses the issues of illegal immigrants, if you will, and border walls and things of that nature. Uh, in the scene um, that we, we have a mob in the street calling to remove the strangers or build that wall, etc. And Thomas More comes out to change their perspective. And this is the speech that Shakespeare wrote, abridged. Grant them removed, and grant that this your noise hath child down all the majesty of England. Imagine that you see the wretched strangers, their babies at their backs and their poor luggage,
plodding to the ports and coasts for transportation, and that you sit as kings in your desires, authority quite silent by your brawl, and you in rough of your opinions clothed. What had you got? I'll tell you. You had taught how insolence and strong hand should prevail, how order should be quelled, and by this pattern, none of you should live an aged man for other ruffians as their fa fancies wrought with self-same hand, self-reasons and self-right would shark on you, and men like ravenous fishes would feed on one another. You'll put down strangers, kill them, cut their throats, possess their houses, and lead the majesty of law in line to slip him like a hound. Say now the king should banish you. Why, you must needs be strangers. Whether would you go? What country, by the nature of your error, should give you harbor? Would you be pleased to find a nation of such barbarous temper that breaking out in hideous violence would not afford you an abode on earth, wet their detested knives against your throats, spurn you like dogs? What would you think to be thus used? This is the stranger's case, and this your mountainish inhumanity. Thank you. Um, qu questions, please, to any of these wonderful authors. And Thank you all for talking about my favorite person that ever lived. Oh, okay. Um, all right. Oh, God, there's so much to comment on. Yes, an English teacher can change your life. I agree with you that there isn't a whole lot known about him because otherwise, why would there be the Edward de Vere Oxford theory? So there is a lot not known about this fabulous person. Um, I've seen a lot of Shakespeare plays in my life. My question to you is, I, I have never seen any Shakespeare plays that were not in English, except for maybe the Kurosawa films. I mean, quasi. Okay. Have you ever seen Shakespeare performed in other languages? But before I tell you that, um, the best, best play I ever saw was in 2012, the RSC put on a show in London, in the central London, with a Bollywood, um, Much Ado About Nothing. The British Indian actress Mira Sayal played Beatrice. I don't remember who played Benedict. But um, it had like the marketplace. The theater was set up as we were in the marketplace. They were selling us goods. There was dancing, Bollywood dancing. It was the most fabulous production I've ever seen. So have you guys seen uh, Shakespeare perform not in English? Many times. Thank you. Yeah, I only watch Many Shakespeare times. in other languages. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Arabic, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah I've, I've seen it in Turkish. Uh, so I, uh, I, I went to college in North Cyprus, the Turkish part of Cyprus. And uh, I, at some point, I learned how to speak the language, and uh, you know the, the the department, the Turkish literature department, uh, you know, in my college actually had Shakespeare. I mean, the translated version, of course, but they played it uh, on stage. I think it must have been Hamlet, you know, a kind of a an abridged version of Hamlet that was staged. I thought it was interesting because uh, Turkish has uh, their inflections and they are, of course, same with uh, you know, uh, various languages. Uh, there's a way in which uh, if you translate a particular work, say, you know, literary work into a different language, it assumes the mannerisms and the uh, complexities of that language, you know, to quote, George Steiner in his beautiful book, uh, Language and Silence, when he talked about how, you know, uh, it, at some point, uh, German became, so some of us see German as an aggressive language now. You know, I've heard someone say that German sounds aggressive to their ears, but that's only because of the, the way in which it was used at one point. So I saw that, uh, you know, when Shakespeare was being played in Turkish, 
uh, you know, there, there, there are ways in which sometimes you, you say certain things that would have been uh, just like in English would come out as like just an offhand remark, but they, they sound a bit more aggressive, like commands almost. And, and, and that was very interesting uh, for me. Um, I would recommend watching uh, an Indian director who I work with a lot, um, Vishal Bharadwaj. He's done a lot of adaptations of Shakespeare set in India, although since you don't speak Hindi, you'll be watching the subtitles, so it'll be like many times removed back in English. <laughs> so I don't know how that would work, but, um, but it's certainly a way to see it in another language and set another uh, context. I've seen a great uh, Twelfth Night at the Jaipur Literature Festival in Hindu, and I understood everything. It was awesome. Yeah. Laugh just after. It was absolutely brilliant. The really? laughs translated yeah. extremely well without even any, any sort of subtitles. And yes. it was like a new, it was not just a translation, it was in a sense and we saw an adaptation. Outdoors. Yeah. It, it, it but the language was incredible. That yes. was absolutely. So the, I've, my work, apart from being a novelist, is I work with, uh, like I said, I work with people who are making the plays in their own languages to mediate their own conflicts. And so some of my work involves. Um, I've worked with uh, a Kosovo and Serbian version of Romeo and Juliet, which is done in Albanian and Serbo-Croat, which is, th for those of you who know about the fall of the former Yugoslavia, the breakup of that, and the horrible war that followed in the 1990s, to, to bring those two languages together on the stage, where you have Serbian actors speaking Albanian, and Albanian actors who all know the Serbo-Croat anyway, because they got forced, it was forced upon them. Um, they, they, they switched it so that each, everyone was speaking each other's language and, and it was a production of Romeo and Juliet and not only was um, the, it, it wasn't as simple as Capulets and Montagues being from either side because they then transformed the actors into different roles so the whole cast was split the Albanians and the Serbs were split and divided through the, through the cast list it wasn't just as simple as two warring families um, I don't speak either of these two languages, but I watched that production from rehearsal right through to performance and then reception in two places, once in Pristina in Kosovo and also on the stage in Belgrade. And it was the first production um, cultural thing that those two governments, one of them is not recognized by the other even as an independent state, had done together since the 1990s. And that is the power of Shakespeare in that context. Um, and it was an extraordinary thing. I didn't need to know how the translation worked while I was watching. And since then, you know, I've had that script translated with working with other people. Um, because all I had to go on was the, was the audience. And knowing the play and these archetypes. So that's one production that I'm really proud to have watched. Uh, thank you. Thanks for the presentation again. This is maybe a little bit uh, going back to what you've already done. You did such a nice job, but I read that uh, like 86 or 86 percent of Shakespeare's lines are spoken by men and only, and only uh, 14 percent by women. So I, I wonder about the paradox of gender and diversity because this is a this is a pretty uh, diverse panel here and everything. How, what do you say to critics that say that Shakespeare's irrelevant? That he's just a, an old dead white guy. <laughs> I don't think we know that he was a, a white guy. I don't know. <laughs> um, I don't know. I don't give. A, I don't really care. Like critics can, c c the poetry speaks for itself. The fact that over history it's lasted is partly to do with cultural dissemination, as we've all said, and colonization and so on. Who knows um, how Tagore would translate if he had been disseminated as widely. I mean, we talk about gender switching. The Mahabharat and the Ramayana are full of gender switching. They are full of men who take, um, who have problems with their masculinity. They're all on different scales. They're born of goddesses and monsters. Some, some women pray hard to become men and warriors so that they can go take revenge on their families and so on. You know, so the fact that Shakespeare only has a certain amount of lines for women, of course that matters and it reflects perhaps some of the generative constraints of the theater at the time where the women couldn't be on the stage. They couldn't even get those actors. But, you know, I don't really 
think that we can take Shakespeare off a curriculum, but I do think the curric curriculum should be more balanced with writers and theatre makers and filmmakers from different, parts of the, from, from different parts of the world, which is very, very closely connected. I also think that it's sometimes it's a hard thing to hold uh, people who have written at a different time in history to modern standards because it's a kind of test of purity that almost no one can pass. To some extent, I, mean, I, I find actually Shakespeare fairly misogynistic. Uh, you know, like I found Taming of the Shrew. I didn't, when I first read it, I thought, yes, this is what should happen to you know, Indian girls who don't behave. They get husbands and they teach them how to behave right. And of course, as I grew older, I completely questioned that and found it really offensive. Um, but I think you, it, to some extent you just value it for what it gives you for that time. I found that if I question too hard and too deep, um, there's almost nothing that's very, there's very little that's worth studying. I mean, Picasso was a misogynist. I mean, great writers and great artists have been in some ways, you know, terrible people. Um, I struggle with this in a larger way about, especially now since the whole, you know, thing with like Me Too and in the entertainment business, like do you separate the art from the artist and how does that go? But it's also race, you know, um, in Shakespeare as well. You know, Jews were of course considered another race, you know, at that time, so it's, you know, it's Shylock, but it's also Othello. Um, that, um, I guess, I guess I, I'm okay with it. I'm okay with Sadiq Shakespeare for what it's worth and without holding him to a more modern standard. I think these are very sufficient answers, really. Uh, I'll just add to that and say that, you know, I, I read Shakespeare for his prose, for the elevated language, for the way it sounds, uh, and, and I consider his work deeply humane, really, uh, most of it at least. Uh, and, uh, well, I don't know if I had expectations regarding diversity and all that, but probably not. Really. <laughs> um, I know we're short on time, so I was curious if one of you could share your favorite Shakespeare character, um, or else the one you think is the least uh, known or valued. Mine would be Macbeth, uh, without uh, even a thought. Uh, the, reason, the reason is because, I mean, he's not a very good character you know, uh, in terms of morality, if I were to judge him. Uh, but there's something innocent about him, you know, uh, at least I've read uh, the play probably three or four times at least, uh, and I've seen it played before. Uh, but he, you know, like the, the children in my book, so uh, in, in The Fisherman, very quickly, uh, there's these four boys, you know, with a you know, dreams and all that, a serene family, and they encounter this guy who has the ability to see the future, and then their lives are transformed. So that's like what happens in Macbeth. He may have had ambitions to become the king, but the, the moment when they see the son uh, speaks to me, you know, I, I keep thinking about the appearance of the three witches, and, and to me, I, I mean, that's the character that I always remember, uh, you know, m most frequently? Um, I don't know. I mean, I remember uh, reading Shakespeare, uh, R Romeo and Juliet, and I'm forgetting the name of Romeo's cousin who was killed right in the middle. Is it ben Bully or something like that? Hmm? Yeah, yeah. How? Mercutio, yes. And being like very sad because I felt like I kind of crushed out on Mercutio. Uh, I don't know why, it's just so charming and lovely and it was very sad for me. So maybe if there was a way to use an underutilized character, is bring Mercutio back and like do a whole other play, just a spin-off based on that. Uh, for me, apart from Leah, um, my favorite play is probably uh, Love, Love's Labour's Lost and it's a difficult play that people don't prefer, perform very often but I think one of the reasons for that is because it's like a kind of summer romance in which the girls teach the boys that love doesn't last, things don't last and they all go back to rule the country and that's how the play ends, the women leave because one of them has to now take up the kingdom and become the queen and it's so clever and so funny 
Um, and they really are um, undervalued. <laughs> so yeah, that would be it. Um, otherwise, if you are interested in Indian Shakespeare, I urge you all to watch Heather, which is the Hamlet set in Kashmir, which has a fantastic female character um, in the form of... Um, the mother. No, the, the girlfriend. The girlfriend? Oh, yeah. I the yeah, no, both, both the women are, are excellent, but the girlfriend in particular, Arshia, she's a journalist, and she is the one who is sort of investigating all of the trauma that Kashmir has been through, and it's so beautifully written and beautifully portrayed. So you won't, you know, you won't miss anything from the Shakespeare, because it is, it is imbued with the spirit of Hamlet. It's a beautiful film. Thank you. We have to stop now. Uh, please, a big round of applause for this wonderful panel. And please support the festival, seriously. We need to bring it back to Colorado, to Boulder. Please support it. Thank you.